So nonetheless, the Basilica of Santa Croce began in the 13th century, consecrated in the 15th century, and, and uh, what's at least most important to me about it, they've got some amazing chapels, they've got some beautiful art, including an artist by the name of Giotto, one of the greatest artists ever, but it's who is buried in the church that is most fascinating to me, because, you know, most churches you go to through Italy, through Europe, whatever, are based on saints. So, you know, a couple days ago, we were touring through Rome on the pilgrimage, and it's unbelievable. You know, we went to a church called Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, and in that church, Catherine of Siena is buried. Well, her body is there. Her head is actually in Siena. But there's her, you know, that's her tomb. That's her body. One of the greatest saints ever. And then just about, oh, 20 yards away from that, just on the left, is a guy by the name of Fra Angelico, otherwise known as Beato Angelico, because he's a blessed. So he's also in heaven. His body, just to the left, uh, he was a great artist. And in fact, you may know the booze that's named after him. Fra Angelico is actually named after a saint, or at least a blessed, there in heaven. So th that's, you know, one church. And then if you walk just down the road, so maybe a quarter mile away from that church in Rome, you have got the church of the Jesu, it's called. And inside of that church, no, not Jesus. <laughs> Jesu means Jesus. He, he's not buried there. Inside of that church, you have St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits. And not far from that church, you have a church where St. James the Lesser and St. Philip are buried. Well, I could go on and on and on. What I love so much about the Church of Santa Croce in the city of Florence, Italy, where we are on today's show, is that it's not saints that are buried there. It's great Italians that are buried there that are never canonized, that are not canonized, but had such influence on the city of Florence, the country of Italy, and the world. For instance, Michelangelo Buonarroti. The great Michelangelo is buried there. Across from him, and some people are surprised by this, is Galileo. Now, I know sometimes there was some controversy of how that all shook out and played out when it came to Galileo and the church. <clears throat> uh, we've already apologized for that, okay? Ch church leadership isn't always right when it comes to matters of not faith and morals. It, it, the popes weren't speaking infallibly centuries ago when they criticized Galileo. I just point that out. Galileo buried in a church, Catholic church, of course. Uh, Mac Machiavelli, if you know anything about him, who he really, modern-day politics and so much of what we know about uh, well, really the art of politicking, persuading people, all of these sorts of things, come from a guy by the name of Niccolo Machiavelli, especially a book he wrote called The Prince. That is in the church. Rossini, he, crea uh, he created many operas. The Barber of Seville is very famous. He actually created the Lone Ranger theme song, believe it or not. He didn't mean to create the Lone Ranger theme song, but that music there, Rossini is buried there. So I could go on and on and on. These are all people buried in the Church of Santa Croce for their contributions to art, their contributions to the church, contributions to the world. They're not canonized saints. Hey, I think they should be. <laughs> Un unfortunately, nobody, can. <laughs> nobody actually cares what I think. But here's what we want to do. It's the Catholic Guy Show on a pilgrimage. And as we've done in many of the churches we have visited, I've had a chance to go up to heaven and interview the saints and meet the saints and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, leaving the church where they're buried and heading up to heaven. Now, of course, this is the modern technology that we really perfected on the show a few years ago when the show was based in New York City. And my, my co-host at the time, Rob Kagren, uh, he was always mad. He was always jealous because I would be able to leave the studios in New York. He was stuck in the studio while well, I went up to heaven to interview the saints. Well, Rob is here on the trip with us and Father Daryl Millett, our chaplain, and a group of our Catholic Guy listeners who are on the pilgrimage with us. They see the churches, and yet then they are jealous as well that only I get to go up and meet the saints. So I want to try something. This is a little tricky, I understand, but what, what I want to try now is I want to head up to heaven. I'd like to talk to Michelangelo myself. I know he's in heaven, or at least I think he's in heaven. He's not a canonized saint, but keep in mind, Everybody in heaven is a saint. It's just that sometimes the church 
holds up and lifts up certain role models of the faith, certain people who lived with heroic virtue. So we lift them up and canonize them as saints, but it means everybody in heaven is a saint. So let's head up there now and see if I can find Michelangelo Buonarroti. It's the Catholic Guy Show as I head up to heaven. Okay, I'm up here in heaven. Uh, test one, two, test one, two. Making sure everybody can hear me. Okay, I'll take your silence as a sign of respect and a sign that everything is working out. So yeah, this is going to be a little trickier, but since all these famous Italians are buried in a church in Florence, I, I got to just look around. It's going to be trickier. There's no halos. I know more or less who I'm looking for. I'd like to find Michelangelo first. If we bump into Galileo, fine. If we see Machiavelli, that's okay. If we see Rossini, all right. All right well, somebody's walking up to me. Boy, it's, it's perfect. Whenever I come up to heaven, it's just the way I always wanted it. Let's see who this is. Hello. Ciao. Buonasera. Buonasera. How are you? I'm a good. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good to see you. Now, uh, there are so many Italians up here in heaven, I don't know who you are. How is that possible? You look like a nice Italian man. And you don't know who I am? Well, let's I'm see. I'm a famous Italian. Yes, and I already set up the bit. So, yes, I know uh, you're a famous uh, Italian. I don't know your bit. Uh. <laughs> uh, yeah, I already, I already set up the premise of the thing. So, let's see. You have a beard. Yes, a beard. Uh, you have olive skin. Yes, sir. A large nose. Yes, sir. I have no idea. Okay, I'm a Michelangelo. Michelangelo, the, the one of the greatest of all time. Uh, yes, I am a great artist. Uh. Yeah, and you've got such a last name. Tell me your last name. Buonarotti. You know what I love about this name is that you have a younger brother. Yes. And and his name is uh <laughs> is uh <laughs> yes I have a younger brother. That's a question. You asked if I had a younger brother. Yeah, it really wasn't a question. It oh. was more of a statement of fact because I love your younger brother's last name. I mean, uh, first name. Okay, Michelangelo doesn't know his yes, younger brother's his, uh, first name. What uh, this is? Um, it's Buonarotto Buonarotti. Right, uh, Buonarotto. Oh, of course, I, I forgot. Yeah, it's okay. I uh, had uh, come as the come as the DJ. A brain uh, la, lapsa. Lapsa. Uh, a brain lapse. Lapsa. Sure, sure. Okay. A lapsa. Sure. Yes. So, uh, what a name! It rolls off the tongue. Michelangelo Buonarotti. You were born and raised right here in the city of, well, I, I guess I'm in heaven now, but uh, in the city of Florence where I just left Yes, from. a beautiful city uh, in, uh, we say, Tuscany, Tuscany, Italy. Now, how old were you? I mean, how old were you? Uh, what year were you born? I was uh, born uh, 1475. Uh, 1475. You know, it's so crazy for us uh, back in the United States because th the fact that you were born before America was discovered, I mean, you were in 1492, you, you were basically a teenager. Do you remember when America was discovered? Of course. Uh, Christopher, Christopher Colombo. Columbus, I think you say. Yes, exactly. Yes. Columbus, he went, uh, he went to uh, the, what he thought was uh, India. He thought there was a different passageway. And I remember when he returned, uh, I had a little coffee with him. And, uh, oh, I, I don't think this is true at all. I, I, I think this story that. is completely made up. I, I think there's no historical record of Michelangelo. And Christopher Columbus ever eaten? Well, it heaven. wasn't uh, for history books. It was I, more of a private uh, conversation. I think you're lying. And I'm uh, sharing with you and your audience. I we had the coffee with a little sambuca inside, <laughs> and uh, we had a little chat about what he saw, and he said it was wonderful. I, I don't believe you. Well, okay. Then. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just letting you know that I, I feel like when I take a trip to heaven, uh, we have an obligation to the audience to give them some factual information. But who are you to judge? Well... Uh, uh, Who are you to judge me? I'm in heaven, uh, and I'm uh, telling you what happened. It was I'm a private conversation. Okay, fine, Michelangelo. <laughs> Does it rub you the wrong way that you were known as Michelangelo, but the world remembers you as Michelangelo, as if it's two different names, as if Michael was your first name and Angelo was your second well, name? Well, I think it's a problem with the English speakers, sure. because still in Italy and in Firenze, where I am from, Florence, and, and in Rome and throughout uh, Italy, people would still say, Michelangelo because there are still children who are named Michelangelo but in the uh, United uh, States of America mm -hmm. they uh, they call me Michelangelo and uh, it's okay but uh, it doesn't seem very proper to not be able to speak uh, 
the proper language of, uh, of Italian. Speaking of the language, you, you seem fluent in English, and then a few times you just have problems with words like stattes, huh? So, well, you know, it's <laughs> a difficult <laughs> thing. What? At times, sure. uh, uh -huh. words, are, uh, words are troublesome. Sure. Words problematic. Are, see, there you go. You can say problematic, but you had a tough time saying stattes. Yes. Uh, sure, I get it. Why it not? It happens. What is it? Uh, is it fair to say... You're the greatest artist in history. Well, I don't know if it's a fair to say. I think a lot of people would say that. I have tried to be a little bit humble about uh, who is the greatest because, uh, well, I'm not necessarily a relativist. It could be relative it's in the sense that, you know, it uh, taste changes over time. And uh, what I may have done may last for a long time, but at some point it could even be destroyed and people wouldn't even recognize the greatness of it. So let me start with this, Michelangelo. As I've read your biographies, if I've understood your life work, it started down in Florence, Italy, where I just was before coming up here to heaven. Yes. And you were trained at a very early age. You had some great, great teachers. Your first teacher, by the way, was who? Was, uh, yes, uh, he was... <laughs> He was a very good teacher. And, yes. uh, Domenico, I, uh, Domenico. Uh, Domenico da Urbano. No, no Domenico, no, Domenico Ghirlandaio. Ghirlandaio. Si, 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 si. You Domenico remember, Ghirlandaio. You remember him now. You're able si, to look. Si, si. Now I, now, I, now I remember. You're able to look yes. it up quickly enough on your biography yes. at Wikipedia. And I was 13 years old when I started with Ghirlandaio. And this was a master. Yes. And he taught you. And then you also got to learn uh, in the school of the Medici family. The Medici family, an extremely wealthy, powerful family in Florence that gave you your chance. So is it fair to say that it, I like when I, when I look at our lives, it, things that we didn't know how it all came together at one point, Michelangelo today could never have been who you became unless it was for the help of people before you, right? No, of course. Uh, it, and I would say twofold. It would be uh, my art, uh, sculpture, paintings, would never have developed if not for those who uh, c created and were imaginative and did art before me because the only way I could conceptualize those things is because I saw them, I experienced them and then of course I take those uh, things and I, I try to develop them even further and of course people like the Medici's and and uh, my teacher, what was his name again? Uh, Domenico Ghirlandaio. See, Ghirlandaio, Ghirlandaio. People like that who gave me opportunity. So I think it's a combination of seeing what people have done before us and then having opportunity to do the same or at times even better. And so one of the first pieces of art you created that really became world famous and still is to this day. And we saw it, you know, it's a Catholic guy pilgrimage that we're doing right now. I'm up in heaven, of course, yes, uh, speaking to you. But a few days ago with the group, we were at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, uh, the Pietà. Yes. When you walk into St. Peter's, the first thing you see on your right, how old were you when you created that? I was a very young uh, teenager, for sure. I uh, was... No, uh, not really, no. Not quite a teenager, no, you maybe. Weren't, you uh, weren't really a teenager. Yeah, somewhere around there. Well, somewhere around there, sure. Do you know? You, you don't but remember how old I think I was you were. 21 years old. No, there, 24, 24. There you go. You, you started it in the Tw year 1499. Yes. You were born in 1475. I'm surprised Correct. I... Correct. I'm surprised I know your information. 24. Well, you know, I did so much. I mean, sure. if you look at uh, a lot of Italy, Florence and Rome and other places, I did a lot of work. So it's hard sometimes to remember what year was what. I right. mean, now, now, is it true that that was originally commissioned for the original St. Peter's Basilica, not the one that is, is seen today? Yes, because of, uh, as I'm sure many of your listeners know, the uh, the, the basilica that people would see today came about after the fact and uh, even some of the work that I did there like the dome which I'm sure you'll talk about later on but I, I'm mentioning it only because I didn't even see that completed just to get the sense of how a big a project this was when they asked me to do the Pietà there wasn't even a thought of a new uh, basilica. Right. And so now, who commissioned that work for you? I have a it feeling. It was a pope. Uh, uh, no, it wasn't a pope. I have a feeling it was the great not Michelangelo the pope, uh, doesn't, doesn't know. It was Cardinal uh, Bileres Lagrolas. He was a French cardinal. Yes, a French, Francais. Oui. You, you, you impressed that I knew that, huh? That I remember to commission. You thought you tricked me up there. No. You I thought you had me. You tricked me. <laughs> no. Yes, I know. I know the games. Joker, <laughs> Joker, What game are we playing here? <laughs> I, I love when you speak Italian, Thank Michelangelo Bonarotti. Que Joker, Joker, Yes, what the game are you thought we were playing? You thought I wouldn't know something. 
And now you, you created it at the age of 24. How long did it take you to make that? It was uh, it was uh, less than a year. And now, do you, when you created something like that, many people what many people don't realize is the great faith that you had, the great devotion to God, the great devotion to the Virgin Mary that you had, so that it was not purely a, an artistic commission that you received. Then it was like, okay, I'm being paid by a cardinal to do this work, so this is how I'm supposed to do it. But you had a great faith. Do you feel like over the centuries that's been kind of lost or forgotten about? It's more about your art and your personality than it has been your faith. Probably. I think because you see... Uh, so many, so many works of art. Not just myself, but others, of course. And the assumption is that they do it just for uh, the uh, sti paycheck, stipend, something like that. Stipend, uh, sure. Whatever you say. Uh, but in reality, uh, I got to do something I love, and I got to be paid for it at the same time. But I lived a pretty austere life. This was just a way for me to express my faith to show my faith and to, more importantly, to encourage the faith of others because obviously when I, uh, when I sculpted, when I painted, uh, there were a lot of people who could not uh, read or write. And so the art was a way for them to learn about uh, the faith, to uh, study about faith, to understand a little more and also to be uh, inspir inspired, inspired, inspired. Excellent job. Yeah, that's Thank right. You. And so, now this is another thing I want to bring up. So you created the Pieta at the age of 24 years old. Yes. One solid piece of marble. Formally, the there was no form. It was just a piece of marble. It wouldn't have looked like anything. If you would have put it somewhere, uh, maybe in the, what they call it, the Modern Art Museum, somebody would have said they did a great job by just <laughs> putting a piece of marble there. But literally, it would have just been a block of marble, nothing. Nothing. That develops into... Uh, Maybe not the most beautiful, but one uh, a beautiful work of art for for the praise of God. And is it true, Michelangelo, that what, when you would see one large piece of marble, you know, and you get it right from the quarry yourself, you saw the statue inside of there, and you used to say what? You chipped away. I chipped away at the marble, and uh, yeah. I got the, the statue. <laughs> no, that's that, what they used to say. No, chip no. away marble, get the, the statue. That's not what you used to say. You used to say. <laughs> I, I, I know you don't know, perhaps. Well, what if you tell me in Italian, maybe. You used to say the statue was already in there. Yes. Your job was to chip away from the stuff that's already keeping it from us seeing. Right, that's what I used to say. <coughs> kind of, I said it in a little different way, but basically, chip away at the marble and get at the statue. That's right. Chip Pretty away close. at the marble, get at the statue. So that was a tremendous work of art at the age of 24 years old. Then a few years later, how old were you when the Pope commissioned you to, to fresco the Sistine Chapel ceiling? I think I was about 29 years old. And is it true that when the Pope commissioned you, you actually said no for several years? Well, because, yes, I did. And the, the truth is, I love to sculpt. I thought that was the, the highest form of art because literally it was, some, like you said, I had to... Uh, chip away at the marble and get at the statue. Yeah. I, they had to, it, that to me. That was the greatest creative a process, and it took the most technical skill at the same time. I felt like a painting, while of course uh, a very high art, didn't take the same technical skill as a sculpting, and it was so it wasn't as high of an art. So I tried to stay away from it for as long as I could. But it is the Pope. What are you going to say? How long can you not? Can you say no to the Pope? Eventually you have to give in. And this is the story I was told. And Michelangelo Buonarroti, we are up here in heaven, and I'm thrilled to finally meet you. It's a nice to meet you, too. A nice to meet another Cugine. Uh, Cugine, are Cugine. we cousins? Cousins. Well, Italian. We're all cousins in Italy. Uh, you know, <laughs> that's sure. Something that I loved was the fact that uh, you didn't do this work because of the Pope even paying you or the, because he was the Pope. You've said no to Popes for years. You did it as an act of faith. Of course. I, I find that uh, remarkable because when we, you know, it's one of the most viewed uh, works of art in the world. Maybe next to that Mona Lisa, which is... Well, eh, I, I eh. Want, before you go any further, I sure. want to make a point. Please. And this is important for people because I'm sure many people 
go to Rome. I know, I think you just said at the beginning of the interview, you take uh, the pilgrimage group through uh, Italy. I think you went to, to Rome. Yes, it's a Catholic guy pilgrimage. I'm, I'm up here in heaven visiting you, and then I got to go back down to Florence to get back with the group. Okay, that's a fine. But lots of people go to St. Peter's. They go to the Vatican Museums where they have the Sistina Chapel. I know that a lot of people visit. I want to say one thing. Oh, good. I know there are a lot of you down there who try to sneak a photo <laughs> underneath the frescoes, underneath the last judgment or the, the ceiling. Stop taking a photo. You're going to ruin the art. Are you saying no? I think you've done it a few times too, Mr. Rully. It's not Rully. Rully, Rully, see. Rulli. Now, are you saying no photo, no video? No photo. <laughs> No video. Because that's what they say in the Sistine. Silencio. That's what they say in the Sistine Chapel. Because it's important. This is a great, not, uh, not to praise myself, but to praise God. It's a great work of art. And if you keep taking your dopey photos, what is going to happen is you, you, you damage the frescoes. No, that's, that's not actually true. No, well, I don't know. It's well, not true because... I'm not a photographer. Flash photography and this kind of thing can damage the frescoes. But taking a, a selfie on your cell phone scientifically it's proven of course that cannot affect the frescoes in any way well don't take it then anyway okay? no that's fine but it's a different argument altogether now, well isn't so it? be it uh, the, the Sistine Chapel I've got I mean I've got so much I could talk to you about you're the greatest of all time well you're to very art. kind here's what's bothered me about you for all these years okay tell me you live for 89 years old yes you created some of the greatest art in the world and guys like your contemporaries you were a contemporary of Leonardo da Vinci of course uh, you guys didn't like each other no I'm not a fan no, I'm a fan of his work but not uh, his personality I'm not even a fan of his work quite frankly you don't like uh, The Last Supper I think it's weak Weak, really? It's a little weak. Well, okay, when he gets up here, I'll let him know. We, oh, oh, Leonardo's not up here. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it takes us some time. I didn't know I that. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> the Almighty probably will not be happy with that information getting out. Maybe he's up here somewhere. Maybe, maybe I just, maybe he, he runs in different circles. Maybe he's got a few more years in purgatory for that dopey Mona Lisa. That could be. I'm not crazy about well, that. Nobody is. It's Weird the uh, beady eyes. She has beady eyes, yes. that's right. I mean, the Da Vinci's Last Supper is okay. Okay. But it does not held the, stood the test of time that your work has, Michelangelo. No, I think you're probably right. But here's what I've th 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 There's a problem I've got here. Okay. Now, I just presumed by coming up to heaven I would find you. Yes, sir. I don't like the fact that you're not Saint Michelangelo Buonarroti. And the reason I say that is this. Who has inspired more faith over the centuries than you with the Pietà, with the Sistine Chapel of the... The creation of Adam and Eve, the last judgment. Our cardinals for centuries have been in the Sistine Chapel. They vote for the next pope under the artistic inspiration of you. Shouldn't you be Saint Michelangelo? Well, I don't know. I don't uh, know if I should be say Saint. It. Uh, say it. You want me to say it? I want you to say it. I should be Saint Michelangelo the Great. Yes, I agree. That's what I really should be. I agree. But you know, I'll be honest, sometimes uh, the people who run uh, the church, right. they don't want to make the regular person, even though I'm necessarily not the regular, but not a, I was not a priest. Uh, even though I lived an austere life, I never became a priest. They'd like to make the priests and the bishops and the cardinals saints a lot of times. It's politics. Yes, a lot it's of politics. politics. You see, this is what I don't like about sometimes the way things work. You lived in the 14 and 1500s. If you had just sat in a chapel and prayed all day long, perhaps your holiness would have allowed you to be canonized. Right. But, but the world would have been lesser because we would not have your art. Of course. And I, it, uh, while I was doing the art, it, especially the ceiling, of course, uh, very difficult to paint on the ceiling. You are on your back most of the day and uh, the paint uh, drip in your eyes. And it was, uh, to me, I used it as a, a penance. And I thought that uh, might have been considered for me to one day be a saint. But uh, like we say, the politics, uh, yes, something. As you something. and I have decided. As yes. you and I have decided, the of politics course. are deciding all of this. Well, Michelangelo Buonarroti the Great. I'm sorry, Michelangelo the Great. Michelangelo maybe, the Great. Maybe, maybe you can propose me as a saint. You are very, very influential. You have a big radio show. I also have a big nose. Yes, you do. It, uh, it <laughs> is quite large. By the way, yours. You have a gigantic nose, and yours was broken when you were a little kid, right? Yes, uh, someone punched on me. That's right, a yes. fellow artist. Yes. Do you remember his name? It was uh, 
Vergeva. Yeah, that's right, Vergeva, sure. I, I don't recall the history book saying that, but Michelangelo, it's a pleasure to meet you. Oh, it's great to meet you, Thank too. you for coming on the show. Uh, I, I will pitch this idea of your canonization. I will admit I don't know if it's going to get much traction. No, I but, don't think so. But because the way, that, well, the way the church also likes to do things, it's holiness, not just accomplishments. It's holiness that matters. Yes, yeah, see, I understand. And, uh, but maybe one day I will, I will be a, a saint. Uh, did you, uh, you know anything that related to saint in your life? Yes, you know, uh, I, I have wrote a book. Called, oh, wonderful. Thank you. I, wrote, I wrote a book called Sinner, and then I wrote a book called Saint. Excellent. Both are available at Amazon.com or wherever fine books are sold. Okay, wonderful. Well, Michelangelo, great meeting you. Enjoy your time up here in heaven. By the way, now... Uh, the reason I came up here in the first place is because I'm on this pilgrimage and we taught, we brought our group to Florence, Italy. We visited the Church of Santa Croce where you are buried. Yes. There are many other great Italians up here. Well, I don't know. They're buried in the church. I was wondering if they're up here in heaven. Is Galileo up here? Because of course he's here. Galileo yes. was buried in the same church. He's buried like across the aisle from you in Santa Croce, right? Yes, of course. We were uh, practically pretty close to contemporary. But is he up here in heaven? Yes, he is here. We have a coffee almost every day. Oh, day. you have coffee with him almost every day? Of course. Well, well, just tell him I said hello. I'd love to tell I him. I don't know if I want to talk to him because these science guys, I don't, I don't understand. Okay, you don't understand. Well, I don't know. You like the art, not I the I like science. the art, things like this. Right? Okay. It's, it's enough already. Understood. All right, well, Michelangelo, great meeting you. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. I got to head back Arrivederci. Now. Arrivederci. I will see you. I hope to be back up here one day. What do you think? I don't know about that. <laughs> I have my doubts. I, I think everybody has their doubts. So there you go. Michelangelo, thanks for uh, hanging out with me in heaven. I got to go back down to earth. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. All right. I've landed safely back here on earth. It's the Catholic Guy Show on a Catholic Guy pilgrimage currently in Florence, Italy. Uh, and that was my uh, interview with Michelangelo Buonarroti when I went up to heaven. Now, if you just tuned into the show, why did I go up there and meet him? Well, because, as I say, we're here in the city of Florence. And when, when we're doing these pilgrimages, we visit so many churches. Everything starts to blend together. But we brought the folks to a church called Santa Croce, which means Holy Cross. It's uh, a church originally started in the 13th century. It began in the year 1294. It's a Franciscan church, one of the largest Franciscan churches in the world. Actually, no, I'm sorry, the largest Franciscan church in the world. And uh, it's not that there are a lot of saints buried there. It's actually that there are a lot of dead, just regular dead people, but people who contributed greatly to art, to science, to faith. So you have people like Michelangelo buried there, Galileo buried in the church, You've got Machiavelli buried in the church. You've got Rossini, the musician, buried there. There are monuments, although they are not buried there, to Marconi, the Italian who created radio. I, I owe him a lot. Uh, the poet Dante, Dante originally from Florence, unfortunately uh, banished from the city of Florence, went up to Ravenna, uh, was buried there, still is buried in Ravenna. So I could go on and on. So many great saints that we, worship, uh, that we honor, of course, as Catholics, and then so many just great people who we've never canonized but still contributed an enormous amount to church. Now, uh, on a Catholic guy pilgrimage here to Turin, Italy, we've seen so many uh, great sites in Rome, in Florence, the city of Orvieto, now in the city of Turin, Italy. We've met many saints, and we've heard a lot of people's reactions to the Shroud of Turin, from those on the pilgrimage, my own reactions, and no trip to Italy is complete without chatting with Timmy the Fly. Now, many of you may remember Timmy the Fly from our Catholic Channel coverage a few years ago when we were broadcasting, Father Dave Dwyer and I, broadcasting for the election of Pope Francis. Well, we didn't know it at the time. We decided we were just electing a pope. And then they elected Pope Francis, and afterwards... We got the exclusive interview with Timmy the Fly, who was just a fly on the wall in the Sistine Chapel. And Timmy is nice enough to join us on some of our pilgrimages. We, we, he just, you know, flies in on the plane and, and then just sits there quietly. And then he gets a free trip to Italy. He's not a paid member of our pilgrimage. But Timmy was sitting in the Shroud of Turin's cathedral, also experiencing it all. So, oh, this is very exciting. Timmy the Fly, how are you? I'm a very good. It's a good to, to be here with you again. <laughs> and uh, now people loved, I mean, uh, they loved your insights 
to the Sistine Chapel, to the election of the Pope. People were fascinated by what you had to say. Well, I'm very happy that I have uh, some insight or because, of course, I'm a fly and I can get into small places and places where we're not allowed. It was wonderful to be there with you when we elected, uh, not we, I mean they, the <laughs> Cardinals, they elected Pope Francis. And what a great Pope, isn't he? He's an amazing Pope. What a good job they did. Now, uh, before we he's talk, he's good for the flies too. Why uh, he, he's good for the flies? Yes, he's very good for for all animals, creation. Well, because he loves creation. Yes, he's a big fan of the environment. Am I right? Of course. So, so I didn't realize. He's pro fly. <laughs> he's pro fly. <laughs> I didn't know that. Or <laughs> uh, so, so he's good for the poor. Yes, he's good for uh, all, all, you know Christians of different, you know, not Catholics and people of different religious denominations yes. and different religions all together. But most importantly, you're saying he's good for the fly. Well, I'm I'm sure you have a big fly audience out there, and uh, yeah. it's, it, they should know that Pope Francis is supporting them. <laughs> well, thank you, Jimmy the Fly, for letting us know. Now, you know, you, have a, you had a bit of a secret when you were in that Sistine Chapel because you were able to see who wasn't voting for Pope Francis. And there are still a couple of them that I'm watching out for because Pope Francis is looking at them too, and he's going to get rid of them soon, I think. Oh, good. Now, we can't trust them, right? No, no, not at all. <laughs> and remember, remember, you know, your, your boss, you know who your boss is? Cardinal Timothy Dolan. Cardinal Timothy Dolan, who runs the, this channel, he's a really great man, and I'm pretty sure he voted for Pope Francis. But if, for those who don't remember, he was eating donuts in the corner of the Sistine <laughs> Chapel all afternoon. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if that's... That's the only reason he didn't want the election to end. <laughs> I, I don't know the if that's... The donuts there are excellent. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. I'll, I got I'll... into some of the glaze. It was wonderful. Oh, you got on some of the glaze. I almost got stuck in the donut. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, by the way, uh, I didn't realize that. So are we saying the Cardinals who did not vote for Pope Francis, that was an anti-fly vote? Yes, it was. <laughs> All right, good. Well, it's always fun to have you here. But now let's be serious. Okay. <laughs> You, you've been with us on this Catholic Guy pilgrimage. What a lovely group. A beautiful group. They're a good-looking group, They right? are very good-looking. You, you of course, the most. Thank you. I don't disagree with that. Uh, do you get the sense they are pro-fly or anti-fly? I think at, at the beginning they were a little skeptical of a fly on the trip and uh, a little anti-fly, but I think I've converted all of them now. They're I, all pro-fly. They're all good, 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 good. So we did Rome. We did Orvieto. We did Florence. These are amazing places and amazing cities. But then we came here to Turin, Italy. You know, I'd never been here before. Uh, had you ever flown around here? I, one time, actually, I came up for the Olympics back in, uh, in 2006, and it was a lovely Olympics. Timmy the Fly came up here for the Olympics. Yes. Okay. I'm an eternal fly. I will never die. <laughs> Apparently not. And uh, so I'd never been to the city of Turin. Great-looking city. I had no idea how good-looking it was. And then the Shroud of Turin. Now, it's in the cathedral, but it is not on display. So if, if, we, if we came here a year ago... That the city's lovely. Well, what did it look like, Timmy, when you were here? I guess I can even ask you. Well, it's in uh, Torino or Torino, as they would say in in, in Italian. Uh, it is a, a a town up in the mountains, actually quite uh, close to France. It's right at the base of the Alps, and uh, so it is a lovely uh, kind of a wintry town. Uh, there is uh, a lot of stuff to do during the winter. You can go very close to Torin. You can go skiing. You can do all kinds of activities in the mountains. It is a very fun place to be. And when I was here almost 10 years ago, I really enjoyed the city. But as you said, it's not a possible to see uh, the shroud. So the cathedral, the cathedral, which is beautiful, beautiful just in and of itself, but the shroud is not... For public display. It's hidden. So you can go into the cathedral and you're like, well, somewhere in here. Well, if I'm going to tell the truth, I'm a fly, so I may have seen the shroud once or twice before. Oh, you snuck around. I snuck in. Well, Timmy the fly can do it. You really can do it all, yes. can't you? Now, this time, they, now, what were your expectations going into this? Well, the truth is, I have not seen the fly. That was a little joke. I was You're not seeing I've the never shroud. seen the shroud before. So, going into it, I... Uh, I have to be honest, I was a tad skeptical. I, and when I say skeptical, it's not that I didn't believe whether it was Jesus or not Jesus. I meant more, I didn't believe I would see much at all. I felt like I would walk in and it would be very, very difficult to see anything uh, recognizing uh, the person of Jesus Christ, or really any person at all, when you look at this shroud. I expected it to be quite small, and uh, what I found was it was much larger than I would have ever, ever imagined. And in particular, I was surprised by how much detail there was in the shroud. I agree with that because the first time I saw this, well, yesterday was the first time I've ever seen the shroud. And it's this Catholic guy pilgrimage. And a lot of people were looking forward to visiting the, the, the shroud yes. of Turin. And I was fine with it. Right. Like, like it wasn't my number one thing. I love Rome. I love Florence. I love Orvieto. I thought, well, this will be neat to bring people. I don't know if I particularly care. Sure. And I, don't, I don't mean it's not that I don't care. But I didn't have any great devotion to it, so it wasn't a huge, huge deal for me to come and see this. And, you know, the whole story behind it is that 
there's some image of a of, looks like a man who was crucified right. on the cloth. It was about a hundred, a little less than a hundred years ago, when somebody took an actual photograph of it, and it was the negative image where the image really popped up. That's what has sold me on it more than what's going on on the image itself was the fact that you could take a picture of it and a negative image of a man shows up. Right. I didn't think you could see too much Timmy the Fly, and I was with you when we saw the shroud in person yesterday. I was shocked at what I was looking at. I could see a man's face, and then the question is, is that man's face Jesus? You know, for me, it was, uh, it was interesting because, as I said, I didn't expect to see much, and then you get up, you, you, you have to wait a long time before you actually get right in front of the shroud, and then once you get in front of the shroud, you only have a few, few minutes at most uh, to look at it. It took, uh, with my small fly eyes, <laughs> it took me about uh, 30 seconds to adjust and to really start staring at it and look for, for particular detail, and as soon as I, I was able to do that, I really saw so much, and I was struck, of course, by the face, most certainly but more than the face i was struck up by the hands the way the hands are crossed over the body you could see a tremendous amount of detail which i never would have expected and for me i almost felt as crazy as this sounds for a fly and for a fly like me i was quite moved timmy the fly was yes. moved now timmy the fly you've made many appearances on the catholic guy show wonderful appearances. oh <laughs> yes always excellent appearances the audience always appreciates your appearances <laughs> And is Timmy the Fly laughing? We, a little. We usually don't There's get a little chuckle. We usually don't get Timmy the Fly to laugh. But you're yell, usually yelling and screaming about something. I'm usually very angry. Right. And so you're usually yelling and you're screaming and you're never quite happy or you're making a joke about being in the Sistine Chapel and what Cardinal was eating too many donuts. That wasn't a joke. Oh. <laughs> yes, of course it was. Sorry, Cardinal Dolan. <laughs> However, now you're saying... You were actually moved by the tar- Shroud moved, of Turin. Quite moved. Maybe not so much while it was going on, because I was so focused on what I was trying to trying to see, some kind of detail. But as soon as I left, I felt uh, uh, almost like chills to my fly body that uh, I had seen the, the face of Jesus. Because I, I think it is important. I've flown all over uh, the world, of course, as a fly. I'm able to go wherever I like. And I've seen lots of places, and I've rocked them all, I think they say. Shaban yes. Jovi says yes, that. Yes, of course. And uh, I've been impressed with uh, only very few things in this world, which is sad, I think, for me more than anything. But uh, And I've seen lots of Catholic sites, places that are important to Catholicism. You've been on many Catholic guy pilgrimages. You've been to so many shrines. You're not an art. You don't like art. No, you don't I like can't stand art. It bores the heck out of me. So you, you, you find art to be boring. Very boring. You find some of the greatest pieces of art. Statues. Architecture. To, you roll, I don't care. You roll your little fly eyes. Yes, boring. But the Shroud of Turin. The Shroud of Turin probably affected me more than anything I've seen in my life. I think you could go to a place where you know the apostles were or even where Jesus was. It's one thing to say you've been to the place where these people were. It's an entirely different thing to think that you just saw the face of God in front of your face. I, I cannot think of anything that would even come close to what I saw yesterday. I must admit, we've done a lot of pilgrimages. I was surprised at the reaction from the people on the trip at that very thing. That it, People are always going to be emotional at certain places and certain times. It's going to touch them in a way. And because, you know, whenever we do these trips, everybody's having fun. Yes. And drinking wine, drinking wine. In fact, you know, yesterday as we were touring around the city of Turin, Turin, Italy, where we are right now, uh, we gave people about 10 minutes break. Right. And, you know, it's me and Father Daryl Millette is our priest. Rob Kagren, my old co-host, is is leading. the Wonderful trip. man. Well, I don't know about that. Very handsome. <laughs> I don't know. Funny. I don't know about that. Excellent. man. But, but he's leading the trip with me. And. You know, we gave people just a few minutes to grab a bottle of water or a little snack before going in because we knew there'd be a long line for the Shroud of Turin. And, you know, three of the ladies grabbed and went, went as quickly as they could to buy bottles of beer. So they could what grab a classy them. group you it's have. a classy group, that's right. And, and so I wasn't sure what the reaction would be as if it would just be, oh, that's the Shroud of Turin, moved on. But you're saying that even you didn't move on, you were moved. And since you're, you're an Italian fly. Yes, of course. They, they did a very beautiful prayer in Italian. Like the, the Cathedral of Turin, everything about this was not a tourist experience. It was a religious experience. Right. It was meant to move devotion or faith that you're not looking just at it. Because to be honest, when I was walking or flying in there, of course, flying, yes. uh, flying in there, I, I thought of it more as an artifact. And uh, just as something to almost look at and study. But as I got there, I realized it was an article of devotion. That's something where we can, faith could be nurtured or nourished or strengthened. Or if we were doubt, if someone was doubting, I think it would be a wonderful opportunity for them to, to look at their own faith and try to be strengthened in it. And the whole experience was essentially, let's how, how can we foster devotion for people who are looking at the face of Jesus? It would be, and I've got, I'm with you, Timmy the Fly. We have seen a lot of things 
in this Catholic world of ours. Tons of things. We have seen a lot of churches. We've seen a lot of museums. The Shroud of Turin might be the most interesting religious experience. I think so. Because, you know, even all of the... We've seen so many bones of apostles who... You know, the bones of, of St. Peter. We've seen... You and, you and I have seen many, 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 many times. Yes, you've flown in with me many times. I've flown right on your shoulder, essentially. <laughs> I was right behind you, breathing down your neck. <laughs> and... Uh, and, and it, it is a moving experience still for me every time I see that, but not even close to looking at the face of God in front of your face. Because the Shroud of Turin has way more questions than it does have answers. And I have my own questions about it too, but I still somehow found tremendous faith and devotion through looking at it. Do you think that's the burial cloth of Jesus Christ? You're just a fly, so nobody has to hold any theological weight to this answer. I think it's much more likely that it is than it isn't. I think it's, I, I wouldn't say 100%. But I, be, I do believe it is. And if it was 100%, then there would be no faith involved. Right, it would just be knowledge. <laughs> but there is something about that face that it's just not explainable. No, of course. And just the, the, the face, and even as you look on the other side, you see the back where clearly this man has been beaten many times, which of course Jesus would have been done. You see wounds over his hands and his feet, which clearly would have been where the nail marks would have been. You see wounds on his head where the crown of thorns would have been. It just seems a little bizarre that all of those things could have come together on one shroud and been there still now for 2,000 years, if not because of the grace of God to help people not nurture their own faith and devotion. And, and when you see the Sistine Chapel, it's gorgeous, Yes, but it's not a religious experience, it's a tourist event. Yes, it is. And here in the Shroud of Turin, they did a good job. Well produced, I think. <laughs> <it's>, uh, <laughs> good job by them. Well it's produced. a very good job. It's a very good job. Well, Timmy the Fly, uh, it's been great having you on our pilgrimage. Yes. I don't, I don't know where you're off to now, but I assume you're flying away somewhere yes, else. Yes, I think I might return to Rome for a few days of relaxation. <laughs> well, that's what I'm up to. Actually. Oh, wonderful. Maybe we can go together. Uh, well, I'm with the girlfriend. I don't know if I want to fly a fly around. Well, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to have a conversation with her. <laughs> well, all right. Fair enough. Timmy the Fly, thanks for being on the pilgrimage. Thanks for your insightful and actual thoughts about the Shroud. Well, it is great being with you. I'm so happy this in, uh, in a wonderful experience that I wasn't yelling about something for a change. I'm very, I'm very happy about that as well. I love you so much. I love you too. Timmy the Fly. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. See you when I see you. Ciao, ciao.